Mr. Ridley, are you there? Mr. Ridley, you there? I think he hung up on me. Uh, there we go. Mr. Ridley, you there? Uh, I am. Uh, give me uh, 20, 30 seconds to go uh, speak to someone. I'll be right there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. No, I'm good. Thank you. No, actually, um, I'll grab one. Okay. Hey, Ms. Mr. Ridley, how you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great. Let me get this uh, working here. Oops. Okay. 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 Yeah, I think uh, I think we're good. Okay. All right. Well, we really appreciate you uh, being willing to do this, uh, especially given this busy time of the uh, of the year to you. Um, but uh, we have about. 50 to 60 kids out here that are excited to hear from you and ask you some questions. Sure. Um, so when we spoke the other day, uh, if you maybe can take a minute or two to explain your life and career, and then, then we'll kind of go from there. That works for you. Uh, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in my office here in Augusta, uh, getting ready actually, uh, tonight to, uh, attend the player's dinner. Uh, for the Augusta National Women's Amateur, which we started in 2019. Uh, that'll be followed. That's a, That starts tomorrow. Uh, and tomorrow and Thursday are the first two rounds at a very nice golf course in the Augusta area called Champions Retreat. And then the players come over here on Friday and practice at Augusta National and then play the finals on Saturday. And then Sunday, uh, we have the drive, chip, and putt, which we've had for a number of years for the uh, young young boys and girls, uh, 80 finalists are qualified around the country. And then of course, uh, next Monday uh, starts master's week. So I'm, I'm a uh, pretty, pretty busy for, for the next, next couple of weeks, but I thought, I thought this would be a great time to do this just leading up to the tournament and, and, uh, and, and hopefully your golfers in the group are, are interested and excited about the upcoming masters. And it might be a good time to do this. You know, I thought before we started, I might just, See if I can do this. Just kind of walk around. I, this is my office in the tournament headquarter building, and there there are a couple of interesting things that uh, you know what I've got this on. Uh, I may not be able to do this because I've got the background on, on is sort of blurred. Okay. And so I don't think that's going to work. I apologize. That's that's my. Let me see if I can change that real fast. I'm not I'm not very tech technologically oriented here, but I may be able to. Well, that's two uh, of us. I'm not either. That's background. Just glad the internet's working. Here we go. I did it. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do I get that off of here? Okay. Um, so this is this is my office, and uh, I don't know. Do, do, do the can the your students see any of this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One of the things I thought would it was kind of interesting. Um, uh, one of our most more distinguished members over the years was uh, President Dwight Eisenhower. And well, one of his, his hobbies that, um, uh, let me see here, here we go. One of his hobbies that he 
um, he really enjoyed and actually started uh, when he was uh, when he became uh, first came came here and became a member in the late 1940s was painting and uh, he painted over over 300 uh, portraits and landscapes in in his life and 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 just you know mostly to give to his friends and other people but it was uh, something he really enjoyed and and in the Eisenhower cabin where I'm actually going to be staying for the next two weeks uh, he had a uh, an area in his uh, little alcove in his bedroom where he painted and overlooked the par three course that we had. And that was really something he really enjoyed. This, this is a pretty famous portrait of Bobby Jones, one of our co-founders. And what president Eisenhower would often do would be to paint, take paintings, very famous paintings and, and copy, copy them and basically paint them themselves. This was a painting. This is president Eisenhower's painting, but it was originally done by uh, a famous artist named Thomas Stevens, who did a number of portraits of Eisenhower as well. And then one of the other more well-known uh, portraits is, um, it was uh, our paintings, landscape paintings. This is a picture some of you golfers may recognize as the 16th hole here. And uh, and, and so that's another, that's, that hangs behind my desk. And then I've got a couple of bookshelves that just have, has some memorabilia in it. Um, this, if you can see this right here, I can't, I'm not sure, I think you can. This is a picture of a dinner in 1976 when I was a young guy playing in the Masters as an amateur. Um, it's probably hard for you to see, but I'm sort of the guy in the corner with all the hair. And okay. uh, that uh, that room is uh, is our grill room and still exists today, although it's been renovated uh, renovated several several times. Uh, the other the other shelf has has a number of different things, but uh, this was uh, this was Sergio Garcia, you know, sinking his winning putt a few years ago. And then here's a picture up here of a presentation we gave to Hideki Matsuyama when he won in uh, 2021. That was a picture of some of the scenes from his winning, which we able, were able to give him actually on the night, the night of the uh, of the, the final round. Um, so just this is kind of where I hang out during the during the tournament and, and at other times during the year. But uh, it's really good to be with all of you, and and I'd be happy to. I, I know I've seen some of your seen your questions. They're they're very uh, thoughtful questions. I, I have a press conference on on Wednesday, uh, uh, right before the tournament, a week from tomorrow, and so I think some of your questions are going to prepare me for that press conference. So oh, I'm ready to, uh, ready to answer them. Well, so we I, also I, we we appreciate you wearing your green jacket too. I some of the kids were excited that uh, that you might wear your green jacket. For the, uh, well, I, 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 it never leaves the grounds, but I usually have it on when I am here. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, well, if maybe take a minute or two to talk about your life in golf, and then I'll, uh, I'll have the kids start asking questions. If, uh, if sure. Sure. You know, I, like a lot of kids growing up in the, in the 1960s, I played, uh, I played a number of sports growing up. I, I was never big enough to play football, but I played, uh, basketball and baseball along, uh, and then started golf when I was about 10. And uh, I sort of basketball was never quite tall enough at the time uh, and, uh, and stopped playing in eighth or ninth grade. And then golf and baseball, both were spring sports that conflicted. And so I, I had to choose one and I chose golf, thankfully. Uh, so I, I was a, a pretty good high school college player. I went to the University of Florida uh, on a golf scholarship and played for the Gator golf team, which was uh, we were one of the better golf teams back in those days. We won the national championship my junior year, but I was, I was never, you know, an all American type college golfer. I was, 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 was good, but not at the very top tier. And so I decided rather than turn professional that I would go to law school. And I, and I actually had been in law school a year uh, uh, and was in, in between my first and second year. And I went to my my dad and, and asked him if if I if he would allow me to play golf one more summer uh, before I went back to school in the fall, and that would sort of be my last last hurrah, my last fling. Uh, and then I would not ask him again to do that, and I would work going forward in the summers until I got my degree. And he he agreed to do that. And I I had met a gentleman named Jack Grout, who who was a very well known golf instructor. I had met him. Uh, in, in this last semester of my uh, senior year in, in undergraduate at Florida. And, uh, and he was best known uh, for being the only teacher Jack Nicholas ever had. 
And so I was able to take some lessons from him in the spring of 1974. And then I, uh, I, I sort of uh, 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 rendezvoused back with him again in, in, in the summer of 1975 and spent about a week with him and worked on my golf game and then took off around the country playing in amateur tournaments. And I played, I played very well all summer. I didn't win anything, but I had a lot of top 10 finishes. And then I qualified at the end of the summer for the U.S. Amateur. And at that time, the U.S. Amateur was all match play, meaning it was head-to-head matches. And, and, and uh, you know, and you started uh, with the full field. Uh, there were some buys. It was kind of a complicated draw process. But, but I ended up winning the tournament. I won eight matches uh, against some pretty good players. Probably the best known of those was a guy named Curtis Strange, who won the U.S. Open a couple of times. Uh, a few years later. And so there I was having completed a year of law school and, uh, you know, and, and people were saying, well, are you going to turn professional now? And I did not feel that winning one tournament really made that much of a difference. So I went back to law school uh, and finished my, my law degree in 1977. I then, I then uh, had an opportunity rather than to go to work for a law firm right away to work for a sports management company called IMG, which is, Probably the founder, a gentleman named Mark McCormick, who founded the company, was considered really the kind of the founder of, of sports management. And uh, and IMG was based in Cleveland, Ohio. I'd grown up in Florida. So I had to decide if I was willing to move to Cleveland, Ohio for my job. I just got married. My wife, who was also from Florida, from Tampa, Florida, we agreed that we'd give it a whirl. And so we took off in our 1974 Cutlass uh, Osmobile to uh, Cleveland, Ohio. We lived there for three years. It was a great experience. And then we came back to Florida in 1980. And I went to work for a law firm and have been practicing law since for the last 40, 40 plus, 40 plus years. You know, during those early years uh, of being a lawyer, I, I really wanted to establish myself as a, as a real professional uh, in my, in my, uh, my trade, if you will being a lawyer. And so I, I really kind of put my clubs in the closet and, and because people that knew me, they knew me as a golfer and I really wanted to be known as a serious, uh, a lawyer and someone who, you know, had worked hard to become good at what I did there. And so it wasn't until, uh, the late 1980s, I played a little bit, but just on a local basis, but it wasn't until I, I had, I did have the opportunity not long after I won the U S amateur to play on the Walker cup team, which was uh, which is sort of the amateur version of the Ryder Cup, and is a very prestigious honor. And so I, I was pleased to play in that in 1977 at Shinnecock Hills in New York, which has hosted several U.S. Opens over the years since then. And uh, so um, so it wasn't until the late 1980s that I sort of got pulled back into golf because I was asked to to be a, a non-playing captain of the Walker Cup team, which I'd played on a decade earlier. And so in 1987 and 1989, I was I served in that role as non-playing captain, and then sort of gradually got back involved in the game, really more more in the business side, more in the administration side than I had uh, than I was as a player. Although I continued to play some and, and still do and, and love it. Um, but in 1994, I was asked to go uh, go on the USGA Executive Committee, which is the board of directors for the United States Golf Association. I was pretty young then. I was about 40 years old, and I did that. Uh, I did that for for 10 years, and and then was asked to uh, assume the role as president, which I did for two years. So, so I spent I spent more than a decade with the USGA, really uh, in golf administration. Uh, the USGA, of course, writes the rules of golf, uh, uh, writes equipment standards, does a lot of things to grow the game of golf, um, and that was a great experience. In the meantime, I was very honored in that in 2000, I was asked to become a member of Augusta National Golf Club, which is something that I never dreamed would ever happen or even really thought much about. But it was it was truly, you know, has been one of the highlights in, of my life in golf. And I've been a member since for the last 23 years. Uh, because of my background in golf, I was asked in 2006 to chair the what we call the competition committees of the Masters. That's for lack of a better phrase, is the tournament committee. And I did that during the 11 years that my predecessor, a gentleman named Billy Payne, who was most well known for bringing the Olympic Games to Atlanta in 1992, he was the chairman of Augusta National at the time. 
And so he and I serve the same 11 year term. He is chairman, me as, 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 as head of the competition, the master's competition. When he decided to step down in 2017, he asked me uh, to become his successor as chairman of the club and of the master's tournament. And so since, since that time for the last almost six years now, that's been my role here at Augusta National is something that I spend a great deal of time on. Probably, probably half of my non-family time is devoted to, uh, to here at Augusta National. The other half, I still practice law with a large law firm called Foley and Lardner. And uh, which is based in the Midwest, but has offices around the country, including Florida. Um, and it's something that I truly love and I'm honored to serve in this role. Um, so that's that's pretty much my life in golf. I will tell you that um, that, you know, you know, you know golf is, uh, has had a major impact on just about everything I've ever done from, uh, you know, from my who my friends are to uh, who I'm married to for the last for 40, almost 45 years actually more than 45 years, almost 46 years, I'd get in trouble. Um, uh, and, and it's something that I've been, I've been very blessed to be involved in. Um, you know, I tell that to people all the time, whether or not they turn professional or whether or not they stay amateurs, get into business or whatever, that golf can help you in so many ways. And the more you give, you give back to the game, the more it gives to you. So I hope, hope that some of you in the class are golfers and uh, if not, maybe that others of you will take it up, but it's been, it's been a wonderful thing for my life. Um, so I think with that, I'm happy to, to uh, answer your questions and, and hopefully provide a little more insight as to, to kind of what, what I do and, and some of the issues that are, that are facing the game. All right. Uh, well, that was great. Um, we, uh, so we'll have the kids ask some questions. So we have golfers, then we have people who, really don't know a whole lot about golf. We studied golf in class, but, um, but we studied a lot of different things. So they'll, they'll come up, they'll introduce themselves and ask a question and then uh, kind of see what you have to say, if that works for you. That's great. Thank All you. Right. All right. Who wants the first question? Come on, somebody step up. All right. Okay, here we go. Mr. Ridley, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm David. Um, I play football. I'm not a big golfer, but I might, you know, switch up my my mojo. <laughs> Maybe I can convince you. Yeah. So my question is, how come the winner can only keep the green jacket for one year? Okay, that that that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, um, a lot of a lot of things around here are based on custom and tradition. And, uh, you know, we, we just feel like, you know, the green jacket belongs right here on the grounds of Augusta National. And, and the one exception to that is, um, is what you just identified, and that is for the year in which the champion uh, is, is, is the current reigning champion, um, he is allowed to, to take the jacket uh, with him, uh, travel with it, wear it uh, wherever he would like, uh, Sergio Garcia, when he won, uh, he actually wore it at his wedding reception, which I thought was kind of interesting. But um, and one of the other reasons that we 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 uh, we don't allow the jacket off the grounds is, as you might imagine, uh, you know, part of maybe what you, some things you may you may have studied in your classes is, is the business of sports memorabilia, and that's a really big business today. Um, and, and, and there have been times in the past where jackets have sort of disappeared. And fortunately, we've gotten almost all of them back. But, you know, to have, you know, we have 34 living champions and to have 34 jackets sort of floating around the world at any given time, just is sort of inviting someone to do something they shouldn't do. I, I don't mean our champions, but somebody who might take the jacket or otherwise. And so we, we have a very... Uh, secure system here at the club where jackets are inventoried and they're checked in and checked out. And we sort of know where they all are, all are at all times, but, you know, it has become an iconic symbol of, of this club and of the master's tournament. And we just prefer that the jackets stay right here at home. Thank you. As they walk up, there may be a little transition time while they're walking up to ask a question. 
Sure. Hello, Mr. Ridley. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm good. How are you? What's your name? Joey. Joey, nice to meet you. So my question is, I know the Masters are coming up next month. Uh, and I was wondering, I'm sure you know probably better than anybody, uh, who do you think is going to win or has the best chance to win the Masters? Well, um, I think one of the exciting things is there's, there's a lot, there are a lot of players who are playing really well. Um, and so I think this has been one of the more exciting uh, years on the PGA Tour with, with some of the young stars really starting to emerge. I mean, uh, some names that we haven't heard a lot of in the past are really starting to, to, uh, you know, to come to the forefront. I mean, just last week uh, in the match play, the Dell match play tournament in Texas, uh, Sam Burns, who's a, a name that people in my part of the world are familiar with. He won the Valspar tournament twice, which is based not too far from Tampa. Um, so Sam's certainly playing well. And if you look at the semifinalists in that tournament, there are probably four names you want to keep an eye, uh, uh, eye on next week. And that's in addition to Sam, uh, he, he beat uh, a fellow from New York named, named Cam, Cam Young uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, finals. And they, they, in turn, beat probably the two best golfers in the world in the semifinals, Scotty Scheffler, our defending champion, and Rory McIlroy. So those would be four names that I would watch for next, uh, next week. I would also uh, watch for uh, players who have won the Masters in the past, like Jordan Spieth. Uh, he certainly is always going to be in contention. Uh, Xander Schauffele is another name. Uh, 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 Colin Morikawa it, it would be one as well. And uh, John Rahm certainly is – I think he's number – I think he was just supplanted as number one in the world by, by Scotty Scheffler when he won at the Players' Championship. So – you know, those are six or eight names that I think I would watch watch very closely. Thank you. All right. Question. Right. Hi there. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? What's your name? Hayden. Hayden. How, nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Um, I got one question for you about the Masters, actually. I was wondering what you thought the hardest part of running a master, like just running a Masters tournament was. Well, um, you know, we, we have we, we have the, uh, the benefit of conducting a, a major sporting event at the same place every year. Uh, when you think about, uh, you know, the Super Bowl or, you know, the U.S. Open, uh, you know, in most other big events, they move around. And so that, that creates complexities that we don't have. So for example, a lot of our infrastructure, a lot of our fiber, our fiber optics, things like that are permanently, uh, uh, you know, installed in the ground. And so we don't have to, it's not like a traveling circus, if you will. Um, but I think, I think the, uh, you know, certainly, you know, one of the big issues that, that I, I worry about that, you know, we obviously take very seriously is the safety of, of everyone involved in the tournament and our, and our security operation is very important. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I think the one aspect of, of running a, a sporting event and in particularly a golf tournament that I think you can't control, but that tends to complicate things when it sort of doesn't cooperate and that's the weather uh, you know when when we have when we have sunshine and good weather things run very very smoothly when we have uh, bad weather particularly when lightning's involved you know you have to move thousands of people you know off the golf course and then then many times the the, the weather will subside then you move them back onto the golf course you have to get all the players off the golf course that's a very complex operation and so I think the one thing that that I worry about the most in, in the side side generally from security is uh, is really, you know, what what how's the weather, how's the weather going to going to impact the tournament? I think I think that creates the most difficult situations that we have to deal with. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Brielle. I'm a golfer. And I was wondering what your advice would be for someone who would want to go into professional golf. Uh, did. May, may I ask if you are asking that question from a competitive standpoint or just the business of golf? Possibly both. Okay. But yeah. Well, I, I think, um, you know, number one, I think you need to look in the mirror and ask yourself, you know, is, is this, you know, real, is this your passion? And um, because, you know, playing golf for a living is, you know, we, you know, we tend to watch the winners walking up the 18th hole on Sunday uh, and it looks very glamorous and, and their life, their lives look very glamorous, but, you know, playing any sport professionally and, 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 and as I'm, because I know the most about golf, I'll say golf is, it's very difficult. It's a very grueling lifestyle. You know, you're away from your family and friends a lot uh, on the road. Um, and so the first thing I would say is, you know, you know, do, you know, make sure you have the commitment and you have the, the passion to, to undertake, you know, that as, as a career. Um, you know, the second thing I would say is, you know, is, is, um, you know, be honest about your, your abilities and your potential. Um, you know, clearly there have been players that have gone out on the tour, men's and women's tour, who have, who have improved vastly after they became professionals. But many times, you know, what you have been able to do leading up to that point in time is somewhat of a predictor of how you're going to do. I, I think, I think the one, the one uh, wild card, if you will, is, is how, how are people really going to adjust to this lifestyle I, I mentioned? And, and, you know, a lot of it really has to do with how much is, you know, how much is in your head and in your heart when, you, when it comes down to it. It's not, it's not just your raw talent. But like anything else in life, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. But what I would say is if that is your passion, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking uh, specifically about the competitive side, if that is your passion, then uh, then I would say I would say go for it. But just remember that it's a it's a it's a real uphill battle. Uh, you have to be willing to get knocked down and get up, you know, and pick yourself up and keep going and not get discouraged because there are going to be some times when things are not going so well. Um, so I, so those would be sort of a few thoughts I would have. I think if, if, as it relates to the business of golf, you know, uh, you know, golf is like any other business. I mean, it's you know, it, it's basically the people who are who work the hardest, who are the most prepared, uh, have the, are the most knowledgeable in their field and who work hard on the relationships that are developed and have to be developed and in, in, in being successful in any business. Um, so I would just say, you know, and, and I would give this advice to whatever you may choose to do in life. But and, I, and I've told my I have three daughters and they're grown now, but I've told them as they've been growing up and even as a young adults that, you know, try to add value to other people's lives. You know, what what can you do to make their life better, you know, and do that without the expectation of anything in return. And that applies to the golf business or anything, whether you get involved in charity, uh, nonprofits, uh, whatever, whatever your endeavors are in life. Uh, and I mean, that. And that that applies to your personal relationships. Um, you know, just do good things for other people uh, and the good things will come back to you. Thank you. Anybody got a question? Even if you've gone, golfers? All right. My name is, uh, my name is Casey. I don't golf for golf team i just golf for the fun of it but um i just want to know through the years out of all the professional golfers you met what's your favorite out of all of them well i've had uh, i've had the, the benefit of knowing many uh many of the great golfers over the past uh actually 50 years i mean i you know i i, I when i won the u.s amateur i was 23 years old and so i was given the opportunity to play in a number of uh of tournaments professional tournaments. And so I met a number of people, uh, you know, in that, in that way, uh, when I was a teenager growing up, you know, golf was just beginning to be televised. I mean, that shows you, you know, what, how ancient I am, but, uh, 
you know, the Masters has the longest standing relationship with any uh, television network, and that's CBS. The first Masters was televised in 1956. Uh, and so, you know, when I was when I was a teenager in the 1960s, you know, golf was pretty much in its infancy as related to to being shown on television. But like a lot of kids my my age, you know, that was that was in the era of what they called the Big Three, which was Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus, and Gary Player from South Africa. Um, Arnold Palmer was my hero. Um, I remember that he came to. Uh, he came to the uh, to the, the country club where my parents were members and played an exhibition with Gary Player. Uh, so two of the most famous golfers in the world were at a were at a club in a little town in Central Florida playing an exhibition, which wouldn't happen today, I don't think. But I I was able to see him as a youngster, uh, and he was in his prime. He would have been thirty five or thirty six years old, uh, and and from that point on, you know, he was my hero. Um, you know, and, and I think it kind of goes back to some of the things I was uh, you know, speaking with the, the, the young lady who, who asked me a question a minute ago, and that is Ar Arnold had, a, had an ability to make everybody feel important. You know, if he walked into the room, there was like a glow that followed him as he walked in the door and he would always pay attention to everyone. You know, he would always speak to people. He was always kind to them. He was all he would always sign their autographs when they asked him. You know, he was interested in what they had to say. All are great qualities, uh, you know, to, to get along with people and to, to, make, to make friends with people. And the other thing is he had a way of, you know, when he was playing golf, he would gaze out into the gallery and everyone along the way was, was, was absolutely convinced that he was looking right at them and only them. And he just had that way about him. He had that charisma that, you know, that, you know, you, know, you either have it or you don't. So, so I guess he was my he was my number one idol. And, and fortunately, uh, in later years, as I got older and he got older, of course, he passed away in 2016. But he, we, he and I became friends. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was really a, a very gratifying to to get to really get to know on a personal level someone who had been my my golfing idol growing up. I would say the other golfer who um, who I probably uh, have known probably better than anyone, even better than Arnold was Jack Nichols. And part of the reason is because, um, is because uh, I mentioned a minute ago that he, he and I had the same teacher. Now, now Mr. Grout, Jack Grout taught Jack Nicholas from the time he was 10 until, you know, till the day Mr. Grout passed away. Whereas I only had a very short period of two or three years where I was with him, but, but that's how, that's really how I met Jack Nicholas was through Jack Grout. And he introduced us, and we played we played a little bit um, at his club in Columbus, Ohio, Muirfield Village. Um, and then then when I won the U.S. Amateur, he had won the Masters the previous year in 1975. And the tradition here is that the defending champion always plays with the U.S. Amateur champion. So I I got to play with Jack Nicholas the first round of the Masters, which was really a treat. So I would say, you know, if I if you ask me who have been my favorite golfers for different reasons. I would have to say, uh, have to say Jack Nicholas and, and Arnold Palmer. Thank you. Okay. I'll ask. All right. While, while they're deciding on the, uh, the next person to ask a question, we spent some time talking about the different traditions of Augusta mm -hmm. other than the, the, giving of the green jacket, what's your favorite tradition um, at the Masters? Uh, well, I think when I, uh, I mean, there are a lot of them, but I think certainly one that's been enduring since, uh, and I'll go back and, and tell you the year and how it started, 1952, and that's our Champions Dinner, which is held on Tuesday evening of, of the Masters. It's become quite a tradition and one that's, that's followed very closely by by a lot of people, um, you know, we like a lot of organizations, sports organizations and otherwise, you know, we we try to be, I would say, appropriately engaged on social media. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have um, Twitter, our Twitter accounts, uh, Instagram accounts, and and we actually post the, the menu every year. Uh, it came out last week on Instagram and it's amazing the interest that people have in what is being served 
for the champion's dinner. The host of the dinner is the defending champion, in this case, is Scotty Scheffler. So it's his, it's his, it's his evening. Um, uh, the, the master of ceremonies, if you will, is Ben Crenshaw. And then I am the invited guest. I'm the only, I'm the only non masters champion who is, who is at the dinner. So I'm, I'm, I'm the guest. I'm not sure I'm the guest of honor, but I'm the guest, a guest. Um, the dinner was, the dinner was started in, uh, in 1952 when Ben Hogan, who was a famous golfer of that era and a master's champion suggested to, to, I mentioned Bobby Jones, one of our co-founders. The other co-founder was a New York banker by the name of Clifford Roberts. Uh, but, uh, uh Hogan suggested to Mr. Roberts that, the, that a dinner be had on an annual basis where the champions could get together uh, share stories, uh, you know, cultivate their friendships, and just have a very uh, nice evening to celebrate the current champion. And so <clears throat> that's when it started in 19, 1952. At that time, I think there were only 13, 12 or 13 champions, so it was a very intimate dinner. Today we have 30, 34 or 35. I think all but two of our past champions uh, will, will be present this year. Uh, one, and the one that's not is – gentleman named Jack, Jack Burke, who just turned 100 years old. So we, oh, wow. we we're giving him a pass. But other than that, it's pretty well attended by everyone. Uh, it's a great evening. Uh, it's, it's just it's like a it's like the most exclusive club, certainly in golf. Uh, and and it's a it's a it's a night of com camaraderie, uh, great uh, storytelling. And it's just it's just a wonderful evening. So I would have to say that's probably my favorite evening of the tournament. OK. All right, I'm going to let the kids come back to asking questions. Got it. No, you're fine. Okay. I got another question for you. Okay. What would you say your most favorite moment in golf history is that, like, you experienced? Um, okay, I think um, uh, here's one that probably nobody would think about. Um, when I uh, when I won the U.S. Amateur, and again you have to be a little bit of a historian to appreciate this, but think about think about any sport that you either participate in or have a passion for, and then think about one of the most famous people in past history in that sport and the opportunity to actually spend time with them in a very private personal setting. So when I won the U.S. Amateur in 1975. Uh, that later, uh, actually, it was the beginning of the following year. It would have been in January of 76. The, the USGA, which which I mentioned a minute ago that I served on their board and was ultimately president, uh, the, one of the main things they do is put is they, they conduct national championships. They conduct 13 of them. One of them is the U.S. Amateur Championship, which was started in 1895. I won it in 1975. And, and uh, the following year at their annual meeting, think of, a, think of an annual stockholders meeting, it's the annual meeting of the USGA. Um, they have a, uh, it's a big, uh, large affair. And on, that's always on a Saturday. On Friday night, uh, they have a, a black tie dinner. Everybody, all the men dress, dress up in tuxedos and the women dress up in, you know, in uh, formal dresses. And uh, it's called it's called the Lynx Club dinner. The reason it's called that is because there is a there is a golf club. It's a it's a golf club without a golf course. It's a, it's a club in New York City in Manhattan on 62nd Street called the Lynx Club. And it's a wonderful place if you're a buff of golf history. But that's where they had this black tie dinner. And every year at this annual meeting, the USGA honors someone by what they and by what they call the Bob Jones Award. Now that's the same Bobby Jones that I mentioned who was a co-founder of Augusta National. It's just that uh, that Bobby Jones preferred to be called uh, by by the name Bob, not Bobby, and so his friends called him Bob. And so the USGA named the award the Bob Jones Award, and it's an award for sportsmanship. And that year, the award was given to Ben Hogan, who I mentioned a minute, a minute ago. Ben Hogan in the 1940s and 50s uh, was, was really the most famous golfer of his time. He, one of the amazing things about his career was the fact that he was in a terrible car accident, nearly was killed, and actually won many championships after he came back from that. He was 
in the hospital for months and, and was out of competition for about a year. But anyhow, um, Ben Hogan was the honoree at this black tie dinner that night, which I got invited to. I was invited to come to the meeting and then was invited to come to go to that dinner as the current U.S. amateur champion. So I was just a young guy, 23 years old. I uh, had no idea what to expect from this dinner. And I got to the dinner uh, and looked at the seating chart and I was seated at the head table right next to Ben Hogan. Now, he had a reputation of being somewhat of a, uh, of a tough person and uh, a little crusty, if you will. And I was so nervous. I didn't know what I was going to say or if he's going to be nice to me or not. Turned out that it was one of the most memorable evenings I, I ever spent. I, up to then and since then in my life, he, was, he could not have been nicer. Uh, he knew why I was there. He knew I was probably kind of nervous. And when I think back that, you know, I actually spent – an evening, three hours plus having dinner with one of the most famous golfers of all time, you know, it's really pretty humbling. So I think, you know, that's sort of an experience that I'll never forget. I've certainly had many others, but that goes down right near the top is some of the, one of the most memorable experiences I've ever had in golf. Thank you. It wasn't, even on, it wasn't even on the golf course. That's cool. Thank you. Hi there again. Hi. So I have a hypothetical question for you. If uh, Tiger and Jack Nicholas grew up in the same era, who do you think would be the better golfer? Same. Well, that, that, that's a great question, and I and I generally I generally stay away from hypotheticals because you know you really never know where you're going to go with those, but um. You know, I, you know, Tiger and Jack really didn't cross in their careers. I mean, they've certainly played in a lot of tournaments together, but Tiger came onto the scenes in 1997, 96, 97. Uh, I think the last Masters Jack played in where he was really truly in, in competition to win was 95, so they were pretty close. Um, but, you know, um, that's really hard to say. I mean, that would that's like um, – Golly, I'm trying to think of a of a good analogy. I'm not sure I can think think of one, but that that would be like um, uh, the uh, you know the the immovable object meeting the irresistible force. Which one's going to win? Um, they both. I, I do think that most people would say that they clearly are the two best golfers of all time, and and you can argue which one might be better. Um, I think. Um, if, if it were just a head on head match on any given golf course and you said, you got to pick one, uh, you know, and they're both in, let's just say they're both in their prime, which I think was, was the premise of your question. Um, I, I probably, if I had to pick one, I would probably pick Tiger Woods. If you were to ask me, if you were to put them in a major championship, uh, uh, I would say particularly the, British are the Open Championship, what we, you know, the, we call the British Open sometime, but it's called the Open Championship, or the U.S. Open, uh, I would probably pick Jack Nicklaus and, and would probably pick him at any major championship, which are the U.S. Open, British Open, Masters, and the PGA Championship. So I think that illustrates, you know, how, how close they are in greatness, and, uh, and I think they probably are head and shoulders, the two – greatest golfers who have ever lived. Now, there are others that I've mentioned that I think have, have equal places in history with them, like Arnold Palmer, Ben Hogan, maybe a few others, Byron Nelson. But as far as who is the greatest of all time, the GOAT, those are the two. They're co-GOATs. Thank you so much. So you've talked about Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas. Have you ever met John Daly? I have. I have. What met was John he Daly. like? Well, he's a lot of fun, uh, and and uh, 
I don't think that uh, I couldn't stay out with him as late as he likes to stay out at night. I'm too old for that. But, you know, John Daly, you know, he was, you know, John Daly's an amazing talent. And I have to think that had he had a little better control over his personal habits, that he probably would have won more tournaments. Um, but he truly was a, <clears throat> was a very talented golfer. I mean, he broke onto the scene when he won the PGA championship back. Oh, golly probably the early 1990s, maybe. And then, then he won a, he won an open championship at St. Andrews, you know, the most famous place in golf. Uh, you know, he, he was, he had a, he had a, just a big golf swing and he hit the ball a mile, particularly for that time, that era. Uh, but, but he also had great uh, feel and touch around the greens. He had a great short game. So uh, I think John Daly is a good, a good person. He's, he's a little different, you know, but, uh, but like I said, he lives life to its fullest. And, uh, uh, but I, I've always, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't spent a lot of time with him. I don't know him that well, but I've, I've always liked him. I think he's a, I think he's a genuine person. Thank you. All right. While the kids are figuring out another person to go, I'm going to ask a question, uh, that I'm sure. interested in. So we've talked a lot about the history of golf. We've uh, in class we talked about Jack Nicklaus winning in 1986 and Tiger winning at a young age in 1997, and these different um, classic moments. Do you have a favorite moment in the history of the Masters? Uh, I do. Uh, actually, it's funny you, you asked me about that because I'm, I'm I'm speaking tonight at this dinner at our Augusta National Women's Amateur. And, uh, and I'm going to mention three of the three favorite moments in my lifetime in Augusta National. You just mentioned one of them, and that was 1986. Uh, and that's, that was the first one. Um, um, well, well I, guess, I guess my favorite moment, personally, is when I played with Jack in the sure. 70s Masters. But, but my favorite Masters moment, you know, uh, historical moment, uh, what would have been when he won in 1986 um, – one the interesting thing about that is I my wife and I were attending the tournament and we we had a flight out of Atlanta late late in the afternoon or maybe even early in the evening and, and Jack made the turn he was six or seven shots behind and we looked at our watches and said well you know we could walk the back nine with Jack Nicholas and finish with him and just about in time to get in the car and drive to Atlanta and catch our plane to go back to Tampa and so we walked that back nine where, when he shot 30, uh, six under par on the last nine, ended up winning the tournament. And so we saw every shot. And it's, we started out on number 10 where there were, you know, a lot of people, but not a typical Jack Nicholas gallery. And as, as he birdied and made a couple of eagles or one eagle, you know, the crowds got bigger and bigger. And so we, 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 uh, we, we were there for every shot. I think this is my second favorite moment was – um, was in 2019 when Tiger Woods won his fifth Masters. And I think it was uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, Tiger had not won a major championship since 2008. He'd won 14 between 97, 1997 and 2008. He had not won since then. So that was, it was kind of a nostalgic moment. You know, Tiger, as you know, has had some personal issues through the years that we all, as we all have, it's just that his are public because he's a, because he's a uh, you know famous person, and uh, and so for him to kind of kind of get that behind him and you know the pictures of you know coming off the green and you know in '97 when he won the first time his father hugged him in 2019 when he won the fifth time he hugged his son, which I thought the you know the, the juxtaposition of that was pretty interesting. Um, that that was if you recall if any of you were watching it that was the year when he held the final putt. And Jim Nance famously said, uh, the, a return to glory. I mean, that's one of those, those quotes that you'll never forget. Um, then I think the third, my third favorite moment was one that you probably would not, you may not even know about or certainly wouldn't guess. And that is the, the tournament that we're having this week, uh, which, is, which was something that started under my watch and I'm very passionate about. And that's the Augusta National Women's Amateur. But the first year, there were two, there were two women, uh, the winner, uh, his name was Jennifer Cupcho, who now is playing the LPGA Tour is being very successful, and a, uh, a woman from Mexico named Maria Fassi, 
who was uh, going to uh, school at the university. Kupcho was a uh, played was in at Wake Forest at the time. Maria Fossey was at Arkansas, and they they sort of uh, ran away from the field. And by the time they were playing the back nine on on the last day, it was really just the two of them. It was almost like a match play, and they were playing in the same group, just two of them. And they went head to head for the last nine holes and played unbelievably well. And the other thing that really struck me about that was the sportsmanship that they exhibited towards one another. They were congratulating each other on their good shots. They were bumping fists. You could tell that they were really in the moment and they were just had, there was a lot of joy in, in, in what they were doing. And, and I just, to me, that just was just a magical moment in our history. And, and I'll, I'll never forget it. So those were the three in my lifetime that I remember the most. And I think they were, were the most significant in our history. All right. I'm going to see if a couple more kids want to ask questions here before we got to go. All right. Anybody? Hey, Mr. Ridley, how are you? I'm doing well. What's your name? My name's Andrew, and I was wondering if you could play a round of golf with any three people, dead or alive, who would it be? Um, well, I mean, I may, I may go back and, and, and kind of pull out some names that, that I haven't talked about yet. Um, one of them certainly would be Bobby Jones. Um, uh, Bobby Jones – uh, died in 1971. The first time I was at Augusta National was in 1976. So I never met him. Uh, I, I never, I never met him. I did meet Clifford Roberts, who was his co-founder, and he was actually um, the chairman of Augusta National from its, its from its founding in 1932 to 1976. That was the last year. So he was in his early 80s. But I, I did get to meet him. So, so I would, it would definitely be Bobby Jones. I think probably uh, the other three would be, I, I would definitely, um, I never met Ben Ho Hogan other than that dinner that I talked about. I never, I never saw him in a golf shot in person. So I definitely would probably have him in the group. And then uh, I would say the third one would be Arnold Palmer. Although I did play golf a couple of times with Arnold, but I mean that threesome, Bobby Jones, Ben Hogan and Arnold Palmer, that would be my, that would be my dream for some. All right. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Ridley. I'm back. Yes. Uh, so my question was, I know you play, I'm sure you play a lot of courses in your life. Uh, other than Augusta, what do you think your favorite course to play was? Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of what goes into opinions about golf course, gosh, you know, golf courses are a little bit like art. You know, it, it's beauties in the eye, the beholder. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, there are a lot of great golf courses uh, that I played and, and that I have great memories about. But I think day in and day out, there are two that, and, and, it's, and it's very interesting because they're very close to one another. Uh, there are two on the West Coast in Pebble Beach, uh, and that's Pebble Beach Golf Links uh, and Cypress Point Golf Club, Cypress Point Club. Uh, you know, both of them are very famous golf courses. Uh, Cypress Point was designed by Alistair McKenzie, who was the designer of Augusta National. So there's a good connection there. Um, Pebble Beach, uh, of course, is famous through the years uh, for having had a number of U.S. Opens uh, for many, many years. They now have what's called the AT&T Pro-Am, which was the successor to uh, what was called the Bing Crosby Pro-Am. Bing Crosby was a famous entertainer and singer who had, this, had the tournament in Pebble Beach for many, many years until he died. Um, and so I, I just, you know, the, it's hard to, it's hard to beat a great golf course that's on, on water and, and, uh, Cypress Point has uh, a few holes, uh, that are on the Pacific ocean. It's sort of a, they sort of have three distinct parts of the golf course. I would say they have, uh, say about a third of the course is, is, uh, in the, what they call the forest kind of going back through the big trees. And then you have, uh, four or five holes that are in the sand dunes. Uh, and then you have some of the closing holes, 15 through, through 17, 15, 16, 17 are on the Pacific Ocean. 
and uh, then then 18 comes back up in the, the trees of the clubhouse. But um, but th those would be my two courses, and it's just because they're great golf courses, but it, it, they're enhanced by the beauty of the surroundings. Thank you. All right, I'm trying to get one more person to ask a question until we kind of close up. So, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm, all right. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Dylan, come on. You can come up. All right. We got a golfer here who just was able to make it. So, okay. Got it. Hi. What's your name? Hi. Uh, I'm Dylan Bond. Dylan, nice to meet yeah. you. So um, with the uh, added yards to the 13th hole, mm -hmm. uh, how do you think uh, the players being able to hit it so far is going to affect Augusta in the future? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, was, I was just looking, looking at sort of some historical facts um, in 1997, when Tiger Woods won the Masters for the first time, uh, the Augusta National Golf Course, uh, uh, the Masters tees were about 6,625 6, 6, yards. Today, they are almost 7,600 yards. And so I have said on more than one occasion that I hope the day never comes when we play the Masters at 8,000 yards. Well, if you if you look at those, if that bracket that bracket from sixty nine twenty five to eight thousand, we're already more than halfway there in a matter of twenty five or so years, and so and I think and I think the the ramp up has sort of been uh, you know a very steep curve over the past probably eight or ten years, and so I think I fear that with um, with you know continuing athletic improvement. Uh, there's sort, of, there's sort of three factors. There's, there's the, 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 the uh, efficiency of the golf swings of the modern player. They got, their golf swings are much more sound uh, from a technical standpoint, and they're able to deliver more energy just by virtue of, the, of the, uh, the effectiveness or the efficiency of their swing. Secondly, they're much more athletic. Uh, golfers today are no longer, you know, scrawny, you know, uh, you know, five feet eight a person, you know, doesn't have any, any body mass or any, any strength. I mean, you know, a lot of the golfers on the tour now look like basketball or at least football players. I mean, they're, they're six feet three, they weigh 212 pounds and they don't have a ounce of body fat and they, they swing at a, you know, a golf club at 125, 130 miles an hour. So I think those things combined with equipment uh, is going to, it will continue. The golf golfers will hit the ball longer and longer. You know, I don't like a lot of anecdotes because they don't really prove anything scientifically, but I'll give you one in the tournament last week in the semi or quarterfinal match, Rory McIlroy was playing a guy named Denny McCarthy who went to the university of Virginia. Um, the last hole was 375 yards and Rory flew the ball on the green. He flew it 347 yards, and then it rolled up to about three feet from the pin. He made a tap-in eagle. Um, that's very exciting, uh, and, and I have nothing against that. I, as a matter of fact, I enjoy watching it. But, you know, I think as it relates to, to people that are involved in running golf tournaments, and, uh, you know, we, we at Augusta National are fortunate in that uh, we can continue to make adjustments to the golf course. A lot of places can't do that. So at the highest level anyway, um, I think that there needs to be some a hard look at how long the players are hitting the ball. You know, we just lengthened, as you mentioned, the 13th tee. Fortunately, we have the property to do it. We we're able to do it in a way to where you won't be able to tell the difference watching it on television. But it's about it's only about 35 or 40 yards longer. But it's long enough to where players are going to have to hit drivers off the tee. They used to hit three woods, which they could sort of bend around the corner. 
And I think they're going to have, you know, a, 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 at least a middle iron and maybe a longer iron uh, or even some hybrids into the greens uh, off of sort of side hill hanging lies. So I think it's going to be more interesting. Um, you know, one of the one of the kind of counterpoints is, you know, golf's hard enough. And, and why why would you try to make it harder by making, you know, regulating a golf ball and making it go shorter? Um, you know, I, th- I don't think I think that's a valid point. I think there's some other practical considerations that need to be addressed. Um, but, you know, for somebody like me, who's still a pretty good golfer, I mean, they are, they're, what they're talking about doing and, and that would result in sort of a pulling back or, if you will, of the distance of the golf ball would affect me maybe six or seven yards. And um, that's that's really not anything that I'm all that concerned about. Um, so, so I think we need to look at it from a big picture um, you know, and, and what's for what's what's best for the game. We certainly don't want to make it any harder. What's being proposed now is that there there be a rule that would they call it a local rule where a tournament could choose to or not or not to adopt this rule. In which case, if they if you did adopt it, a golf ball would have to conform to some modified specifications. So we'll have to see what happens. It's a pretty long process. Um, you know, I, I think for us, we continue to evolve and react as we have to, as these players continue to hit it longer, you know, um, and, and I think you should watch those, you, you are golfers and golf fans watch closely at the masters this week and see how far they're hitting in and what they're hitting into the holes. One of my concerns about players hitting the ball so far is it kind of, it takes some of the excitement out of the game on the, on the next shot. If you're hitting just a pitching wedge or a flip shot into every part four, it's not all really that, that exciting. Um, you know, back in gone are the days when, you know, when players were, would have to hit a five iron and maybe hit a little draw or a little fade, uh, you know, those days are not gone anymore except on par fives. Um, so anyhow, it's an interesting question. There's two sides to the argument, and we'll just have to see what happens. But it's, it's going to take a couple of years for it to play out. Gotcha. Thank you. All right, Mr. Ridley, our, our school day is kind of uh, finishing up here. So, uh, so first off, thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with us. Um, well, it was my pleasure. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, it sounds like you've got a really interesting course and a lot of very uh, intelligent and inquisitive students. And, uh, you know, I, I wish, wish all of them well uh, in whatever they do. And I hope some of them will end up in some part of the golf, uh, golfing world or golf business or, or sport, other sports, perhaps. Yeah. I, I am going to ask one last question if I can. So we've been doing this class a couple, couple years and, and we had a student who I thought this was a great thing. He said, we should always kind of close up with what would be one piece of life advice you'd give to a high school student. So just in life, what would be a, a piece of advice you'd give to a high school student? Well, I mean, I, I think I touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, when when uh, a young lady asked me about you know advice for a career in golf, um, you know I, I you know I, I, I would say um, um, you know I, I would just say that if 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 you're lucky, uh, you know your life will be a marathon and not a sprint, and that uh, you know don't don't get too um, don't get too hung up in you know in in the short term. You know think about think about your, your long-term goals and think about setting goals, you know, personal goals, uh, professional goals. Uh, you know, if you don't have a roadmap for where you want to go, the chances are you're not going to, you're not going to go there. Um, and, and, and the other thing I would say is, um, whenever, whenever, whenever you get involved in a situation where you're not sure if it's the right thing or not, um, you know, what I would say is that, you know, is that you know a life a lifetime of of good deeds and your and the reputation that you build up over a lifetime can be uh, severely damaged with one with one bad uh, one, one bad decision and so um, I, and I don't say I say that and in, in not having you don't be afraid to make a mistake we all make mistakes. But sometimes really big mistakes, errors in judgment, doing things you shouldn't be doing, uh, doing things that hurt other people, 
um, that bring, uh, you know, embarrassment to yourself or your family, um, they're, they're hard to recover from. And uh, I think generally, you know, most people and certainly Americans are forgiving and, you know, and, and they believe in redemption, but, but just try not to get yourself in, in those situations. And, um, you know, I would just say set your goals, you know, plan in, as far in, in advance as you can. And really, whenever you do anything, think about how the other party, the other person is going to react to what you might say or do. Um, and if you can see things through the eyes of other people, uh, a lot of times it'll, it will guide you uh, in how you're going to approach problems in your life. So, I mean, I could go on for a long time talking about this subject because you know, I've learned a lot by, you know, the hard way. I've learned a lot by making mistakes, but I've also learned by watching others. And I would suggest you do the same thing, that you, 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 you see people that are successful, that are doing the right things. Watch how they treat other people. And, and watch how they treat other people when they don't know somebody else is looking. That's the most important thing. You know, anybody can be nice to some, somebody who's very important or famous, uh, but, but, but how do they treat, you know, how do they treat the waiters and waitresses in restaurants? You know, how, how do they treat the custodian at your school? Those are things that will give you an indication of what a person is really like. And you should think about that as well, because people are going to be watching you. All right. Uh, well, that, great advice. This was great. Uh, that's we're very, very appreciative. You took the time. We'll be watching the, uh, the Masters next week and, uh, and can't thank you enough. Well, my pleasure. Congratulations for doing what you're doing here. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, you've got a bunch of great students and they're going to do great things. All right. Well, thank you. Good luck uh, this week and next week. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks.